The resurrection of Jesus Christ is basic, fundamental, and vital when it comes to the gospel of Christ. And you'll find that as the apostles and early evangelists went out to preach the gospel, wherever they went, seemingly right after they preached about the ignominious, shameful death of Christ on the cross, they mentioned strongly the resurrection. And the fact of the resurrection, of course, is recorded by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it would be hard pressing upon people to strive even to disprove the adequate evidence and credible witnesses that declare that Christ was raised from the dead to die no more. If you remove the resurrection of Christ from the gospel, you've destroyed the gospel. If you prove what the Bible says about Jesus Christ being raised from the dead to die no more, that he was raised from the dead to die no more, then everything else in the Bible fits and is true. So it's a fitting subject when you turn to the historical section of the New Testament, the book of Acts, to find that in the first recorded gospel sermon, that is Peter's sermon, the day that the church was established in Jerusalem, that the res resurrection of Christ is certainly emphasized. When he preached that first sermon, here's what he preached. Verse 23 and verse 32 regarding that matter. He says to his audience, and he's very plain, frank, candid, and pointed. Speaking of the Christ, he says, Him ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Then he says, Whom God raised up. Then he says, verse 32, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now, they could have easily discredited the apostles as witnesses if Christ was still in the tomb. They could have easily found that tomb. And they could have said, there's the stone still sealed by Pilate's seal, and he's still in there. They could have rolled back that and brought the body out but they couldn't. We haven't got time to go into all the details that serve as proof of the resurrection of Christ. But they're there. This preaching of the resurrected Christ was strongly opposed by the Jewish leaders, especially the Sadducees, who were the priestly class because they didn't believe in the resurrection or angels or spirits. And they had Peter and John following the miracle worked on the lame man to, so he could walk again. And the crowd that came together and preaching that was done in the name of Jesus, they had those men, I say, put into prison. They beheld the boldness of Peter and John for such statements as Luke records in Acts 4 and verse 10 where it was declared by Peter, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you whole. They were bold. They were plain. And it was very clear that they announced that Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead. When you look at the Apostle Paul's preaching, he preached the resurrection to the Greeks. Now, these folks I mentioned just now, there in Jerusalem were Jews and proselytes. But to those who didn't know about the God of the Bible or the Jews or the law of Moses, he still preached the resurrection to the Jews in the city of Athens, Acts 17, 30 and 31. That didn't fit their scheme of things. Many of them 
mocked him when he got to the resurrection of the dead. But he preached it because it was a fact. And without the resurrection, there's no hope for anybody on this earth. You'll notice that as he wrote, that is the Apostle Paul, to the church in Corinth that he pointed out the three great truths of the gospel. And they are the death, the burial, and the resurrection. He says, I presented those to you when I first came there, when you were converted, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4. And that's what you still stand in if you haven't believed in vain. There is a marvelous and wonderful statement found in Hebrews 7 and verse 25. Scripture reads, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, this covers the second point. Christ is raised from the dead to die no more, and he ever liveth. That is a wonderful statement. What meaning it ought to have to every one of us who are children of God and members of the spiritual body of Christ, where God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. I don't know whether you've ever done this. I'm sure to a certain extent you have. But just visit cemeteries. Most of the time, about all the time we do that, it's when we go to a burial in a cemetery or we go to visit some loved one's grave, something like that. When I was growing up in Camden, because back in the early days of the United States and that part of the world, it was quite a significant town on the riverbank there. You could reach New Orleans on steamboats going down to Washita River to Red River to Mississippi to New Orleans, and we don't realize it, but up through even past the time of the Civil War, the till the railroad took over, the steamships plied all these rivers regularly. That's how they got whatever they got. And the Butterfield Stagecoach Route, which was one of the main thoroughfares of the front, frontier part of the United States, also ran by Camden. So we would go out to what we call the Old Camden Cemetery. The first grave there was of a little girl who died on a steamboat when they were docked there overnight. And she was buried there and started the cemetery for Camden. And there's a big steamboat chain that marks the edge, boundaries of the grave. Davy Crockett's sister is buried there whatever that's worth. <laughs> There's also, for those of you who don't know history, you'll just have to go learn it. Henry Clay's brother, Senator Henry Clay's brother's buried there. But they were quite elaborate in giving some sort of biographies on a lot of their big tombstones. And you walk there and here's somebody that was buried in 1850 or whatever. And you stand and you ponder, here was a person who had his aspirations and desires, and ups and downs, and loves and loss, all of that. And as far as his moral remains, he's been right here longer than he has anywhere else. And it might do us well sometimes to realize how feeble we are, mortally speaking, to go out to wherever, and you may already have your burial place selected, and just sit there and say, now, if this world lasts a thousand years, my mortal remains are going to be there and nowhere else a lot longer than it was where my spirit dwelt in this body. What does that say about how much time we could give to the physical and to the material? But the thing that I'm interested in, in view of this sermon having to do with the resurrected Christ, raised to die no more and that he ever lives, is that he will get us out of our grave. And he's the only one who can do that. Because when Paul deals with the resurrection of the body in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he points out, if Christ be not raised, we are of all men most miserable. Because there is not any hope for us. Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul said, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. 
Jesus himself said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19.10. We should not lose track of that as to what our responsibility is in the church, the spiritual body of Christ. We are expected to live righteous lives and in doing so preach the gospel to every creature, to do our best to reach people with the gospel. Our Lord's death upon the cross had one purpose in mind, the salvation of man's souls. His blood was shed to cleanse us from our sins. Ephesians 1, 7, Colossians 1, 13 through 14, and that's emphasized in so many areas, Romans 5, 9 through 10. But to unbelievers, as it was at that time, who were not open to revelation, whose mind was anchored in physical things, and who were sensual, who were interested only in empirical matters, then the cross or the word the cross to them was foolishness when they heard it preached. 1 Corinthians 1.18. That a dead man, in other words, could save a person or anybody was ridiculous. And to that mind, that caliber mind today, it still is. It's still foolishness. But the Lord Jesus Christ is not dead. He ever lives, having been raised from the dead by the power of God. And now as Peter declared in Acts 2, sits at the right hand of God ruling. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes to the Father but by him. John 14, 6. When our Lord sent his apostles into the world to preach the gospel, we know this so well. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. The reason, of course, is that the gospel is the power of God to save people. People cannot be saved apart from knowing and complying with the terms of the gospel. Romans 1.16, I say. God could save us any way He chose to, but I'm telling you the way He chose to. I'm quite sure if God said, well, if you'll just uh, go dip your big toe in running water and then make a mud ball and throw it up against a tree and you'll be saved, somebody would be saying somewhere, well, I believe you can save me anywhere you want to. And so on and so on when it comes down to the fermented thinking of mere mortals. The word of Jesus Christ, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8 11, the sword of the spirit, Ephesians 6 17, is a living and active word, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. The living Christ makes it so. Christ be not raised, what good is the gospel? How could the word of God be living and active? He's able, according to the scriptures, to save to the uttermost, seeing he ever lives. I wish I could understand the details of what it is as Christ does what he does at the right hand of God on your behalf and my behalf as members of the church. But I know what the scripture reveals is sufficient. But my human interest is there. Our Lord is the key. He and He alone is able to save. Because He is alive, He ever lives. And then to add to that, Hebrews 7.25 tells us why after His resurrection, ascension, and coronation, that he ever rules and lives. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. So we're taught in Hebrews 7.25. And repeatedly as you go through the book of Hebrews, he's called our high priest. Watch this. The writer says, and I'm putting several scriptures together, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus. Then he has, we have not an high priest that cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
Then this too, this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, having a high priest over the house of God. What is our response? He says, let us draw near. Hebrews 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 7, verse 24, chapter 10, verse 21. Look at the emphasis in that letter to those Jews who were actually thinking about departing from the New Testament system. In effect, he's saying, where are you going to go if you leave this system? There certainly won't be another age in which God's going to extend a way of salvation. This is it. As the ninth chapter of Hebrews shows, the principal duties of the high priest of the Old Testament were to offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. And in so doing, they interceded for the people to God. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12, listen. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. That is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now if that's not good news, I don't know what it is. Christ is at once then the sacrifice as well as the high priest who offers that sacrifice. Now what better mediator would there be? In spite of our best efforts, no matter how hard you put forth your human will to practice what you know is truth, you are a human and you will at times fail. John writes, If any man sin, we have an advocate, Christ Jesus the righteous. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Do you realize what he's saying? Christ is on retainer. Now, that's a poor way of saying it. It's far more than that. But, you know, when you have an attorney on retainer, he's there at your beck and call when you need an attorney. You don't have to go look one up. He's there. Well, for those of us who have loved the truth and from the heart obeyed the gospel, being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, the Lord having added us to His church where are all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Acts 2.47, Ephesians 1, verse 3, Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27. Then look what we have. We have a heavenly attorney as it was. How does he understand what I undergo here? Why, he's the son of man. He's been here. Tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. He knows what weighs us down. He knows what it is. The difference is, he never broke God's law. Thus, he could go to the cross a perfect sacrifice, a sinless sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world to use the words of John, the forerunner of the Christ. And he could shed his blood out of his body and it was a sinless body. And blood always equates with life. So he gave his life for us. And sometimes before we take the Lord's Supper, we sing the song, he gave his life for me. For him to shed his blood was willingly and lovingly giving his life for us and offering his body a sacrifice for our sins. So Christ is at once the sacrifice, but he's also the high priest who offers it. Advocate. That's a good word. Look at it more so. He's at the throne of God to advocate for us. Well, that's the work of an advocate. Now, what's amazing is that he can tend to me and mine as if I'm the only one to tend to, but he does that for you in the same way. And he intends for us to have that understanding. Only God could do that. Who knows all things is ever present. Consider that He cares for us. 
We sing a song trying to emphasize that sometimes Jesus knows, Jesus cares. Right of Hebrews, in Hebrews 2, and verse 18, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to suffer them that are tempted. There's no trial you can undergo, no trial any human being can undergo where he does not care. Christ is not looking at us trying to find a weak point so he can condemn us. You cannot find that kind of Christ pictured in the words of the New Testament. He cares when troubles beset us. I think that, as I said some weeks ago at some point, when Christ is pictured as standing at the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr, that standing always indicates concern. If you get concerned about something, you stand up. He cares. He cares when pain comes and won't go away and it's excruciating pain. He cares. This brings up this point. It doesn't directly connect with this, but it shows you the alertness of Christ even while he died that terrible, terrible, excruciating, painful death in shame on the cross. Look at every one of what the Bible gives to us of the comments of Christ on the cross. And there is no indication that his mind was impaired at all. That he was fully cognizant and aware right to the very end what he was doing. Look at every comment. And their intelligent comment. He kept himself alive knowing why he was dying and suffering for all the sins mankind committed. And he ended it all by his own will as he had plainly said, nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down. And I'll take it up again. And that's where we are today in the gospel. And so as he came to the end of having suffered to the uttermost, no more need to suffer. Only God could know how much suffering needed to be done in Christ to satisfy him. Read Isaiah 53. He said, it's finished. Father, into my hand, thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. He willed himself to die when he had suffered long enough. But he also said, I take it up again, and he did. Early on the morning of the third day, he rose to die no more. And he ascended back to heaven. And he's right where he has been all along, doing the work of the advocate, the intercessor. He cares. People say, I don't care, or you don't care about me, or you don't love me, or you don't treat me this way. You know, you never have to be concerned about that as a faithful member of the church. Though they all forsake, whoever it might be, Christ will not forsake you. If one is to plead for us, we want one who can feel for us. I use the word feeling directly because he was a human on this earth, mortal as we are. He's in glorified state now, but at the time he was here, he felt and went through things just like we do. So we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he went through what we're going through. This is our high priest. And we don't take advantage of it. Look what privileges in the kingdom that we have he ever lives to make intercession for us. He ever lives to keep us clean from sin. Remember, you know, Christ shed his blood to cleanse people from their sins. Paul wrote this in Romans 5, verses 8 through 10. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. When you turn over to Hebrews chapter 9, 
You'll find the inspired writer declaring and describing in that declaration the work of Christ as our high priest. And he says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer purifying the unclean, all that had to do with the acts of work, uh, approach of Israel to God and the law of Moses, <laughs> sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Now listen. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verses 13 and 14. There's not a one of us. That doesn't mean we're all guilty of the same sins. That's not the point. Not the point at all. But there's not a one of us that can't sit down. And if we want to dredge up everything into the past, we can think of sins we committed. But the wonderful thing about all of it is, is that when we were baptized into Christ as penitent believers, to obtain the remission of our sins, God cleansed us. Those sins are no longer held against us. We're the slates wiped clean, as it were. Blotted out, really, is the better, as the Scripture uses it, as if they'd never been. And without the blood of Christ, none could be made free from sin. And without the blood of Christ, none of us could remain faithful in the Lord's church. I'm as much in need of the blood of Christ now after all these years of being a Christian as I was before I was baptized. It's just in a different way. But His blood not only cleanses people then from sin to make them Christians, the blood of Christ then continues to cleanse us from all sin as we're faithful in the church. John declared, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But, now here's the familiar part, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1, 5-7. through 7. We have been called out of darkness and into His marvelous light by the gospel message, 1 Peter 2.9. And that blood we contacted in being baptized into His death, Romans 6, 3 and 4, cleansing us for our alien sins, continues to cleanse us as we're faithful to Him in the church. Thus, living an acceptable life has nothing to do with I made a mistake. It has to do with the general purpose of the, from the very core of your being to obey Christ no matter what. And that also involves confessing your sins and praying God for forgiveness. It's the person who will not confess those sins that's in trouble. It's the person who will not repent, who will not confess sins. One reason it talks about confessing sins is because that's indicative of the fact you've repented of them. There is the constant reality that I can sin in ignorance. And there's the constant reality I can sin out of human weakness. And thus the blood of Christ continues to cleanse me from such sins. Surely by the fact we're taught we must grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ shows that at times in our life in the church we don't know certain things. Well, what happens if we sin in ignorance? And we don't know it. We didn't want to. We didn't intend to. We were studying to keep from being ignorant. But we sinned out of ignorance. The blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. Because there is a great difference in the person striving to do right and making a mistake from time to time out of ignorance and weakness and in the person who doesn't try, who doesn't care, who never studies the Bible, who doesn't want to know. The gospel's boring to them. They're tired of it. Maybe one time they weren't, but they are now. And they don't even try anymore. That person does not have the blood of Christ continuing to cleanse them. They are unfaithful. Thus, living an acceptable life does not mean just making, we'll go through and finally say, well, I, I never made a mistake. You can't boast to God about that. 
Bible plainly says, he who thinketh he stand and take heed lest he fall. When you start thinking that way, you're closer to falling, if you haven't already fallen, than you would be otherwise. There's always room for examination of self, of questioning oneself. So we must be in the light, a child of God, a Christian, so the blood of Christ can continue to cleanse us from sin. Note again the context. If we walk in the light, that's the light of truth. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Notice we can't get that stage if we say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm living so right, I don't have any sins. The Bible says we do that, we deceive ourselves. It says the truth's not in us if we'll reach that stage. 1 John 1, 7 and 8. Every honest person knows about such things. But I'm, I'm happy to tell you in the gospel system, God has made provision for that. Isn't that a wonderful thought? It should be if it's not. In so many ways we fail to measure up. We miss the mark. That's what sin is, 1 John 3, 4. And how terrible to have to live with guilty knowledge of our own shortcomings. That's not saying once saved, always saved. Because that doctrine says you can sin all you want to once you're saved. And God's not going to pay attention to it. In fact, it encourages sin. Ben Bogard in debate, which was one of the greatest Baptist debaters that existed in the first part of the 20th century, in debating the once saved, always saved position, would actually get up and debate and say that the drunk who's been saved and is in a ditch on Sunday morning, having been drunk all night, is just as saved as the person who is in worship and who studies and who does all the Bible says. Well, that's Calvinism. So you can't do anything in order to be saved in Calvinism. God saves you regardless. And that's the reason they would say such a thing. But we shouldn't run from that all the way over to the point to where, well, I've got to be perfect on my own, in and of my own Bible knowledge. I've got to be flawless. I can't make a mistake. I asked a preacher one time, said there was a fellow who obeyed the gospel when he was in his 40s. He had lived a life pretty rough and he used bad language all the time. But he had converted and he was trying or appeared to be. But he was a roofer and he got on top of that roof one time and he hit his thumb with the hammer and he let out a terrible word and fell off the house and died right there as he saved. You know the answer to that? You ought to stay down on the roof of that house. The point being made is when you're striving to learn the truth and willing to turn from any error you see and you're praying about it all the time and active in the church, doing the work of the church, Jesus takes care of you. There's far cry different from a person like that and a person who just throws up his hands and quits. Jesus died and arose, never liveth to make intercession for us. He's our advocate with the Father. He's cleansing us constantly with His blood. And this is the basis of our assurance, written in Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, watch how he says it, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. Not boldness to enter into the holiest by my own will, by my own determination and perfection by works I've done but by the blood of Christ by the blood of Christ none of us lives a good enough life to have boldness to come before God our boldness comes because of the blood of Jesus Christ which we contacted when we were baptized into him into his death and which continues to cover us as we pray, as we worship correctly, as we do those things God says. He continues to cleanse us from sin because He ever lives to do so. After His resurrection, He told the apostles to preach the gospel throughout all the world. And He said, as you do that, lo, I'm with you always, Matthew 28, 20. Think of your own life. Wherever you go, He's with you. Whatever troubles you, 
whatever kind they may be that come upon you. He's with you. Because He ever lives, then His promise is, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. The prayer of Paul for beloved brethren was this, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. Three chapters later in the admonition, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If I have to depend strictly on my own human strength, I'll fail. But the Holy Spirit has given us most of the New Testament for our own spiritual good as Christians. If we will spend time with it and meditate our own lives in the light of it, it will make all the difference in the world. That strength comes in all sorts of ways. The fellowship we enjoy with faithful brethren supplies great strength. I think I heard from several people that we miss being together on, in worship and Bible study periods when we were out. Why? Well, you need to let the Bible answer that as to why. Paul even mentions a thorn in the flesh, which he thought was really handicapping him, and he prayed three times about it. And the Lord said, My strength is made perfect in weakness. Verse 9. One of the things we ought to do is recognize our weaknesses, admit them, and then work toward overcoming them. The Lord will be with us. Paul's conclusion is this. It ought to be ours. I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest upon me. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Verse 10. If we depend on our own strength without trusting in God based upon His Word, forgetting that Christ is there ever making intercession for us and that He ever liveth to do, that He's our advocate pleading our case, that providentially He's working with us all the time. And when we forget those things, we tend to try to face life's problems on our own. And that just won't work. Because of the presence, strength, and help of Christ, here's what our beloved brother Paul could say. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Philippians 1, 21 and chapter 4, verse 13. There's a reason for that. Because Christ ever lives. And He lives for us. Also His presence, His strength, and His help is promised to us when we dedicate our lives to Him. That's the reason you have such passages, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where we remain faithful, doing the things God enjoins upon us. Yes, Jesus ever lives. And because He lives, as the song says, we can face tomorrow. You know how we face tomorrow? As we live one day at a time. We take care of things according to the Scriptures today. And whatever tomorrow brings, we can face it. Enter into the holiest. Draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Hold fast the profession of our faith was the admonition of the Hebrews writer. Hebrews 10, 19-23. So, what shall we say in conclusion? Well, it's a simple conclusion, but it's a, an amazingly important one. Because Christ ever lives, we ought to live for Him. Because we have nobody else. If the day that you depart this world, your mind's about you, your family may be gathered around the bed and bathe the fevered brow and hold your hand. But when you depart this body, they can't go with you. So what's waiting on the other side? Well, I like to think of it like it was in this picture in Luke 16. A band of angels escorted Lazarus right to Abraham's bosom. Do you think that happens only once? Or does that show God's care for His children who die? I won't have to cross Jordan alone. When this life pales in insignificance and I depart this life, cross the river, there's eternal life beyond anything we can think of. 
Surely that ought to give us comfort and strength. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, we invite you to obey the gospel. As a child of God, you've wondered, will these words not move you to repent of your sins and come back? Confession of sins and prayer, whatever it may be, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.